Thanks. So this is going to be the first lecture over the second half of the course, guys. We're starting material today for the uh, fourth exam. And the fourth exam will be everything about the nervous system. It's going to cover uh, chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14. But before we get to that, I have been uh, bad, I guess, about not telling you or reminding you about an assignment called the short paper. And um, it's in your syllabus. It mentions it in the fine print that is due on the 21st of October. Well, that's not going to happen. Okay? And so I'm going to extend this. It's just my total, totally my fault. I'm going to extend this assignment until November, until the Thanksgiving break. Okay? I think that's the 25th-ish, the Tuesday, right before we go into Thanksgiving. There's no class on Wednesday of Thanksgiving week. So whatever that date is, right before we go into Thanksgiving break, is when this assignment will be due. The short paper is, what is it? Yeah. So the short paper is very much a short paper. It's four paragraphs long. The assignment is posted, if you go to Blackboard, under lecture materials, it's the top thing you'll see. And it says uh, short paper requirements. And uh, I'm going to just give you a, a, a synopsis of this paper. And then I want you to look at it, or read it, or print it out between now and Thursday, and ask me any questions about what I'm expecting. But basically, the short paper is a chance for you to find out about anything that you're interested in related to the human body. It could be a medication, a condition, a disease, something you've heard about that you want to learn more about, maybe even a condition someone in your family suffers from, and you just want to learn more about it. You're going to find three articles related to that topic. So let's say diabetes. You're going to find three articles about diabetes. You're going to read those three articles, and then you are going to write one paragraph about what each article taught you. That's all you're doing, okay? Um, I'm not looking for a lot of quotations. I'm not looking for any kind of research kind of paper. It really is just a synopsis of what you learned from the three articles. The fourth paragraph, you just simply put down, I chose this topic because, and you tell me why you personally chose that topic. That's it. Okay, it's four paragraphs. Then you, you also include a hard copy of the three papers because I will read many of those. Uh, this is my way of staying current as well. So as you find new information, you'll pass it on to me. I'll stay current on, on topics as well. So make sure you're only printing out or looking for articles that you can get full length. And uh, you'll attach that. You'll put down a citation. You'll have all three citations properly cited at the end of this document and it's worth 50 points. There's no reason why anyone shouldn't get all 50 points, okay? Um, if you follow the rubric, follow what I ask you to do, then you will have no problem making all 50 points. So this is like half, you know, this is a, an example only worth 80 points. So this is a big grade. I mean, 50 out of 50 is a good grade boosting opportunity for you. And so I will give you the next couple of days to look over these requirements and then come back to me on Thursday, specifically with any questions that you don't understand. And then I'm always available to answer any questions about this assignment. But we'll push the due date until the Tuesday night going into Thanksgiving. I will take it any time before then, right? Any time. You can give it to me Thursday, right? But just no later than Thanksgiving, OK? So is it going to be, sorry, I'm Go ahead. Um, is it going to be the hard copy we give you? Or hard copy you give me. Okay. Hard copy you give me and you will also upload your four paragraphs to SafeAssign, which is an anti-plagiarism tool that I'll tell you more about. But when you go onto Blackboard, you will see a little green check mark, and you will upload your four paragraphs, your paper, to this program called SafeAssign. And it just assures me that you haven't ripped off someone's assignment from last semester. So it checks against previous admissions submissions uh, here as well as around the country. So uh, it's just a way of making sure that you haven't cheated off somebody else. But, uh, that's, but, so you will have a, a little bit that's submitted online, but you will give me a hard copy along with the hard copy of the actual papers. So that's the short paper, again, due by Thanksgiving. And um, read through this. If there's any questions at all, please let me know on Thursday or anytime thereafter. But try to look at it, and then I'll, I'll mention this again uh, when we see each other next time. So that's the short paper. 50-point uh, grade. That's a nice one for you. And then everything we're doing today, then, is now related to the nervous system. 
If you go on to the syllabus, take a look at that, you will see that our next exam is going to cover 53 through 72. And I do apologize, I still am having a hard time finding the exact version of the vocab that you have in your packet versus what I have on the screen. I know that Lunar was on the last set. But we'll do this next test will go from lice, right, lyso, all the way through, I think it's plasia, 72. Okay, so 53 through 72, um, through plasia. And as always, you can go ahead and make up those cards and get started with that so that you're not stressing about the vocabulary. Vocabulary, uh, having just graded that exam, went really well for most people. It really did. But there's still a subset of students, perhaps none of you who are here, who are giving me nothing. They're just leaving a blank, or they're, or they're only getting maybe one or two of them right. So those individuals need to see me. If you are getting less than 75% of the questions in the vocab, then you're just not approaching it the, rest, the best way for you. And let's figure out a different way. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. And if you're struggling with that, let's talk about another way of, of being, being uh, successful on that. The, uh, the vocab, I think, gets easier because as we go through the semester, we've already talked about many of these things in some other way. And so you've already got something to connect these terms with. So let me go through these terms. I should also say on the exam, uh, the scores went from in the 20s up to 96 or something like that percent. So there were some very nice grades. Uh, there were a lot in the middle. And then there was really too many, though, that were down low. So it, it, there's just some folks who aren't putting forth the time. I don't think there's anything here that people can't handle as far as the content, right? We can do the content. It's just the volume of content that some people are struggling with. And I'm, I'm sure if I took a poll of grades versus uh, hours spent, there would be a pretty strong correlation. So if you are struggling and you're making below a 75%, as I just said in the email, please consider a study group, getting with Janae during walk-in tutoring or Andrew, get into one of the SI sections, come see me during my office hours, talk with Mr. Mueller um, about things in lab as well. There are a lot of resources here for you. And don't forget to also come look at your last exam. Uh, I only had, I think, six or seven people come look at their last exam. And you do learn from looking at old exams. There is something to be learned from by looking at exams. And so I encourage that. Yes? Are you allowed to take them? No. No, you're not allowed to take them. Uh, but they are available for you to review. And they'll be there until the next exam. Uh, through uh, the next exam, you can review these exams. OK, uh, vocabulary. So starting with lice, lyso. We've seen lysosomes, right? Organelles that break things down. Uh, lice is to break. Uh, macro, large. Macrophages are large eating cells, part of your immune system. And macle means stain or spot. There's a, a visual disease called macular degeneration. And maybe you've heard of this condition. And in this condition, in the visual field, there's a spot, a black stain that gets larger with time until they can't see. So macle means stain or spot. Uh, mal, bad, malicious activity, but also malaria. Um, we didn't know. Before we understood what caused malaria, they thought it was bad air, literally, malaria, bad air. Um, we know differently now. Malacia is softening, osteomalacia. If you don't get enough vitamin C, your bones are actually quite soft, and uh, that would be osteomalacia, softening. Mam and mast, both referring to the breast. Meate, you already know this. You know what uh, the meatus is, the external auditory meatus in the temporal bone. You know it's a passageway. And medi, middle, uh, medial, um, meaning toward the middle. Mega, large. Megaly, enlargement. So if you have spleen, splenomegaly, you have an enlarged spleen. If you have a hepatomegaly, you have an enlarged liver, something like that. Melano, that is a typo. It should be M-E-L-A-N-O. Did that typo stay on your form? I don't know. But it should be M-E-L-A-N-O, referring to pigment, like black. Remember, melanocytes are the cells that have the pigment that make your skin color. Mens and menstru, both referring to the monthly gift. MERS and MER, right? We saw sarcomere, right? We know it's a part of the muscle. A polymer, something made up of many 
part, so mere or mer parts. Uh, mes in the middle, when we get to the digestive system in a couple of weeks and you're dissecting the fetal pigs, you'll see the mesentery. That's this layer of tissue kind of in the middle of the intestines. Meta, after or beyond, think metastasis, right? Something moves beyond its normal place, metastasis, when cancer spreads. Or metabol, change. Uh, metabol is referring to your metabolism, right? All the chemical reactions occurring in your body, all of those chemical changes that are occurring. METR, uterus or womb, in the middle of the term endometrium, right? You will see METR. So it's referring to the womb or the uterus. Micro is small. Remember mitosis, mito? When scientists first looked under the microscope and they saw cells dividing, they didn't know what they were looking at, but what they saw were thread-like structures in mitosis. We now know that those threads are chromosomes, but they didn't know what these were. So from the Greek, mitosis is referring to the thread-like structures. And then mono meaning one or single. I'll finish up with today on 58. Morph. I'll talk about morphology today, the study of shape. And we'll see that some neurons have very different shapes, and more referring to form or shape. Moral, mulberry, uh, in early, early development, after your cells undergo cleavage from 2, 4, 8, 16 cells, that first very solid ball of cells is referred to as the morula, and uh, it, it comes from little mulberry or blackberry type structure. Multi, many, or much, multinucleated cells with more than one nucleus. There are two cells that we've discussed so far in this class that are multinucleated. What are they? Two cells that are multinucleated. Have more than one nucleus. Skeletal muscle, remember? Long, skin, skinny muscle cell that has multi, multiple nuclei. The other one, cells that eat up bone, osteoclast. Remember, they were described as being multinucleated, phagocytic, hydrogen. Uh, hydrochloric acid secreting. Uh, muta, uh, mutation is a change in your DNA. And finally, myo, referring to muscle. Okay. So keep on going with your vocab. I think you'll find that, I, I think it gets easier. I, I, I think we've got more connections with these terms as we go through this. Now this brings us to chapter 11. That's the next chapter you have in your PowerPoints. It comes right after the information you had on muscle that we finished up with. And this is chapter 11. We'll, we'll focus on chapter 11 today. I may not quite get to the last five or six slides, but we'll finish up this next time. Uh, next time will be chapter 12, which is the spinal cord. After the spinal cord, we'll have a chapter on the brain. And then finally, we'll finish up this conversation on the nervous system with the autonomic nervous system. So there's going to be four chapters on this test, 11, 12, 13 and 14, all related to the nervous system. This is also the topic of your lab, right? Starting on Thursday and next Tuesday, uh, this will be our nervous system lab that's coming up. So the class is kind of back into synchrony. So the nervous system, we can talk about it in a couple of different ways. One will be very easy. It's the anatomical division, okay? And uh, the other will be functional. If I were to ask you what does the nervous system do, we'd have no trouble coming up with the idea that it somehow is our command center, right? it controls everything, that it is receiving information from our environment, and somehow it's sending instructions to the rest of our body uh, to do things. Like I said, the nervous system has two different ways of being divided, a structural and functional way. And let's start off with structural. This is very, very simple. You've got two subdivisions, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system, the CNS, is the brain and the spinal cord. That's it, okay? Just the brain and the spinal cord. If something pokes out of the brain or pokes out of the spinal cord or is somewhere else in your body, that is gonna be part of the peripheral nervous system, the PNS. In the peripheral nervous system, we'll be learning about Cranial nerves. Cranial nerves are nerves that pop out of the brain, out of the cranium. Uh, there are spinal nerves, the nerves that pop off the spine. They're outside of the brain. They're outside of the spinal cord, so they are peripheral. And then there are these structures called ganglia. 
I'll mention them now. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. They won't make any sense to you for a couple of weeks or a couple of lectures, but we'll come back to them. Ganglia are going to be clusters of neuron cell bodies. And when you look at the picture, I'll show them to you. So this picture doesn't quite have the color uh, distinction that I would like it to have. But in this picture, what you have is the central nervous system shown in tan. So you've got the brain and the spinal cord, right? And that's the extent of the central nervous system. Everything else is the peripheral nervous system, and that's what's shown in yellow. So everything you're seeing that's yellow on this image, all the nerves of the body, um, the nerves popping out of the brain, the nerves popping out of the spine, those are all part of the peripheral nervous system. And also labeled here for us is this word ganglia. The ganglia are these little button-like structures that are right along the spinal cord. They're outside of the spinal cord. Right? And we'll see them, we'll talk about them when the time comes. So that is dealing with the spinal or the uh, nervous system in an anatomical way. We can also, however, talk about the functional uh, divisions of the nervous system. And well, this is much more, I shouldn't say much more complex, but it's a little bit more involved. So when we think about the functional, the way that the brain and spinal cord work together, we're going to see that the CNS and the PNS are going to work together. Okay, so the, the, the brain, the spinal cord is going to collect information. It's going to receive information, isn't it? Uh, and then it's going to take that information and process it, evaluate it, integrate it, think about it, however you want to think about that. And then finally, the uh, nervous system is going to uh, take that information and respond to it in some meaningful way. It's going to send instructions out, maybe telling you to run away, maybe telling you to, to move a muscle, perhaps telling uh, your glands to secrete something. So we can break this, the nervous system up into different divisions. First, it's the sensory division. Now, the other word for the sensory division is the afferent division. And I will overemphasize the A. You'll hear other people just say afferent, right, afferent. And that's OK. But as we're learning this, I want to overemphasize the afferent. This is the incoming information. This is coming in from two places. This is coming in either from your external environment, right? What you can see and hear and touch, feel. But this is also information coming in from your viscera, from your internal organs. Then there's also the motor division. This side is sending signals out. Think movement of some sort. The other name for the motor division is the efferent. Okay, so there's the afferent and the efferent. The efferent, think exit, it's leaving, it's outflowing information. Now, the information that's going out is going to go to a muscle, telling that muscle to contract, or it could be going to a gland, telling that gland to secrete something. Now, when, you, when we look at this more carefully, we're going to see that uh, the sensory and the motor divisions are going to utilize parts of the peripheral and parts of the central nervous system. This table is really nice. It's just really straightforward. It helps us to figure this out. So we've got the overall nervous system on the top. And again, this is functional, right? Not anatomical. Anatomical is just brain and spinal cord is central. Everything else is peripheral. And it tells us that the nervous system can be broken up into two large divisions, sensory or afferent, and on the other side, motor or efferent. But this also goes a little bit further. The sensory nervous system, the sensory division, can be further broken up into the somatic sensory and the visceral sensory. There's a word here that we need to understand, and that is soma or somatic. We haven't seen that term yet, okay? but soma means body. So your somatic sensory is basically receiving signals from the surface of your body. This is your touch. This is smell, hearing, taste. Um, it's also mentioning your joints and muscles, and I'll come back to that in a second. The other side is the visceral sensory. Well, that makes sense, right? Visceral, referring to your internal organs. 
This is information coming in from your bladder. Do you have to go to the bathroom or not? This is your stomach. Are you hungry or not? This is uh, measuring even your heart. Is your heart pressure, your blood pressure, is it, is it too high, too low? So that's your visceral sensory information. On the other side, we have the motor side. It, too, can be broken up into two divisions. Somatic motor. Think movement of the body, right? Soma, somatic. This is going to be specifically your voluntary nervous system. Voluntary nervous system. That means your skeletal muscle, right? Because you know that the only kind of muscle that is voluntary is skeletal muscle. So all the muscles that we learned and named in lab, those are skeletal muscle. You have voluntary control over them. But then there's also the autonomic motor. Autonomic motor, you're going to say autonomic, you're going to spell autonomic, but you're going to be thinking automatic, right? This is the part of the motor system that happens for you without your voluntary consciousness. This is your smooth muscle, right, involuntary. This is your cardiac muscle, also involuntary. And this is your glandular secretions. You don't tell your, you know, you don't tell your, your gut to start making digestive juices, right? That's all being done for you automatically. Under this box, under this box of autonomic motor, I want you to put another division. And we'll be dealing with this in the last chapter of this exam, chapter 14. And we'll further divide this autonomic nervous system into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, okay? So we'll, we'll deal with this, the last chapter when we're coming together, we'll deal with this last little box right here, okay? We won't talk much about it for the next couple of days, but then we'll come back and dive into a little bit more about this whole autonomic motor side. And we'll talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic. You may have heard of them as fight or flight. Fight or flight is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic is your rest and digest side. We'll talk about that quite a bit more detail. If you didn't catch what I just said, here it is in words. So we've got the sensory division. It is somatic sensory and visceral sensory. There is, however, a new word that I want to pull out of this slide for you, and that is this term, proprioception. So right in the middle of this slide, you see the word proprioception. Proprioception is your knowledge of your body's position. So somatic sensory, I told you, was things coming from the surface. That's true. It's your vision. It's your hearing. It's your, it's your smell. It's the touch. It's balance. It's all of those things. But your somatic sensory is also your sense of proprioception, your knowledge of where you are. You can close your eyes, and without looking in the mirror, I know that my arm is straight out, and I know that I'm standing, and I know even if I didn't tell my arm to bend, I still know that my elbow is bent, right? And the reason I know that without looking is this idea of proprioception. Your muscles and your joints are also sending signals into your brain, telling your brain what is your body's position. Right? You close your eyes, you know you're sitting, not only because you feel the pressure on your butt, but your body just tells you, right? This a knowledge of self, this awareness of your own position, proprioception, really cool stuff. Then that visceral sensory, again, that's the stuff deeper, right? That's the internal organ. That's how, is my stomach full? Is my bladder empty? Um, is my heart beating? Is my respiration rate high or low? All of that information is coming back to you also through this visceral sensory side of your nervous system. The motor side also has two sides to it, or two parts to it. Somatic motor, as I said, this is what's sending signals to your skeletal muscles. So some books will call this the voluntary nervous system, what you have control of as far as telling it to move, versus the autonomic motor. As I said, that's your automatic or your involuntary responses. So you don't have control over it, but certainly your cardiac muscle is still going, your smooth muscle is working, and your glands are still secreting. Like I said, we'll spend more time on autonomic motor later on, 
and this bottom number should be 14. Okay, so this is uh, in the new, the new text. That is going to be chapter 14 for us when we look at the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Well, how does this whole thing work, right? We talked about the different divisions. We've got brain, brain and spinal cord, central nervous system, and we've got everything outside of that being peripheral nervous system. We talked about how the brain brings in information and sends it out. How in the world does this happen? Well, there are cells involved, and those cells, those cells that make up our nervous tissue, there's a few different ones, but the one we're going to learn the most about are neurons. Neurons are the most important cell that we're going to deal with. Now, neurons have some special characteristics about them. Uh, number one, they are excitable. Now, what other cells did we say earlier were excitable? Yeah, muscle. Excitable means that it can receive an electrical signal and respond. So neurons respond to signals, and they are, quote, excitable. We're not going to spend much time at all this semester dealing with how this works. But in 106, we will dive in very, very deeply and learn how is it that electrical signals travel down a neuron and what happens chemically and with the sodium and the ions that are involved. So we'll deal with that story next semester. Just know for now that neurons are excitable. Neurons also um, have a very high metabolic rate. That means they have a lot of chemical reactions. Right? We just saw that word metabol, meaning all of the chemical reactions, the changes that are occurring in your cell. So they have a high metabolic rate. They are making a lot of proteins, right? And making proteins <coughs> takes ATP and energy. So I'm telling you right now, they are highly metabolic, and that means that they're also high energy, right? They're very needy cells. They're going to have a lot of mitochondria. Makes sense. Number two, these neurons have extreme longevity. As a fetus, they're put into place. You've got your neurons, they're put into place. They're not all connected yet, right? It's sort of like having all the cords available for you at birth, and they haven't all been connected, but they're all there, right? So we don't make too many more new neurons. We make some, but the vast majority of your neurons are already in place at birth. And number three, they're non-mitotic. Once they're developed, once they're in place, they don't divide. You can't injure a neuron and expect it to replace itself or divide. This is why spinal cord injury and brain injury is so traumatic and so devastating because unlike skin or muscle, right, nervous tissue doesn't regenerate. So once you lose it, it's gone. Very little regeneration capacity. So these neurons are highly metabolic, very, very energy needy. Uh, they live your entire lifespan, and they're not replaceable. Now, there are other cells in nervous tissue that support and help the neurons. These are called the glial cells. Some books will call them the neuroglial cells. And we know that glia means what? Glue, right? So these are the cells that, quote, glue the neurons, glue the nervous system together. These glial cells are non-excitable. Right? They don't respond to electrical signals, but they are there to support and nourish the neurons. There are four types. I'll go through each of them in a few minutes, one by one, tell you what they're doing, and show you a picture of them. There are astrocytes, ependymal cells, microglia, and these cells called oligodendrocytes. While we're here, just so that later on it makes sense to you, please go ahead and write that these are glial cells in the CNS. I'll make that distinction later on, but these four glial cells are only found in the central nervous system. So let's talk first about neurons. If you started to look at your lab six pre-lab, you know that part of that will be learning about the parts of the neuron We'll spend time looking at the neuron under the microscope. We'll take time to label the parts of the neuron. Let me start that conversation now. So neurons are a unique cell. They're very different than the other cells you've learned about. They have a unique shape, and they have unique features. 
the average neuron that we're going to look, in, look at in love and label this semester is going to have a soma. The soma, there is that soma again, right? We just said somatic meant body. So soma, another term for soma is the cell body. And that is going to be pretty much what you think of as the cell. That's going to be the majority of the cytoplasm. And inside the soma, you would have the, the nucleus, right? all the normal stuff of a cell. And it is the soma, or the cell body, that is going to be receiving all of the information. Out in the cytoplasm of a neuron, there are also nissel bodies. Now, one of the things about neurology and neuro neuroscience is that there are a lot of names, a lot of new vocabulary, and some of these terms are like Golgi, right? They're named after the person who described them. And so we're stuck with this term, Nissel bodies. So when Nissel looked under the microscope and saw neurons, he noted that within the cytoplasm, there were these splotchy spots. Didn't know what they were, right? But they got his name on them, Nissel bodies. We now know that those Nissel bodies are dark staining areas of densely packed ribosomes and rough ER. What did I tell you? Neurons are very metabolic. They're making lots of things. They're making lots of proteins. Okay. So there's so many ribosomes and so much ER that you can actually see it in the light microscope as what we call Nissel bodies. You normally would not see these in a normal cell. Right? There's not enough of them to see. Another term I want you to know as well is perikaryon. Peri, P-E-R-I, perimeter, right? Perimesium. We've seen that peri before. Uh, so that's around. And what's karyo mean? Perikaryon, karyo. Nucleus, right? So what is that telling me? Perikaryon is everything around the nucleus. Okay. It's really another term used for the soma or another word used for the cell body, okay, the perikaryon. You can think of it as being the cytoplasm. It's everything around the nucleus of a neuron. What really makes neurons unique is their shape. And what you'll see is that most neurons have a lot of dendrites. We know what this term means. Dend means tree. Ite means small, little trees, right? Little trees, small trees. And they are considered processes, just like in bone, something that sticks out to process. So these processes, lots of these dendrites, and I'll tell you more about them in a second. And then there's an axon. And I probably should, just for clarity, make that singular, right? Um, all the neurons that we're going to see are going to have a single axon. So I'll go ahead and cross off that S so there's no confusion. Just one axon. So let's first talk about these dendrites. These are these little tree-like branches. They tend to be kind of short, relatively small. Some neurons will only have one dendrite, but the vast majority will have many. In fact, we know that some dendrites will have as many, or some, sorry, some neurons will have as many as 100,000 dendrites. So when you're looking at pictures of the nervous system, they're always going to draw these cute little neurons with five or six little dendrites. But keep in mind, that's way oversimplified. Most neurons will have thousands, tens of thousands, even as many as 100,000 of these dendrites. These dendrites are receiving the electrical information. They're receiving the signals. Information flowing through a neuron, electrical information, is always unidirectional. So you've got information coming in at the dendrites, and the information is now going toward the soma, toward the cell body, toward the perikaryon. The more dendrites that a neuron has suggests that that neuron must be capable of receiving more signals. Okay, so the more dendrites you have, the more incoming information that can come in simultaneously. And so we'll find that many of the um, dendrite, many of the neurons in the spinal cord, in the brain, that are receiving thousands of signals at the same time have many, many dendrites. Axon 
is going to be the one longer process. It's going to be much longer. And information, electrical information, is going to travel down the axon away from the soma. So axon away, right? The axon carries the information away from the soma. The axon is attached or connected to the soma at a structure called the axon hillock. Strange little word. If you think of the axon as being like a plunger, okay, and the plunger end, right, the long stick is the axon, and the plunger head is now the axon hillock. It's almost like the axon hillock is the portion that connects the axon to the soma. The axon, there'll only be one of them coming off from the soma, but that axon can branch, and those branches will be called collaterals, side chains or branches. Finally, at the very, very end of the axon, there will be branches, little branches at the end referred to as telodendria. Telodendria. What does telo mean? Anybody know? We had telophase. Well, what was telophase? The last phase of mitosis. Right? So telo means end or last. So telodendria are what? Little trees at the end. Right? Telodendria, trees at the end. And so at the end of the axon will be these little tiny branches called the telodendria. Other books will call them the axon terminals. Same thing. Axon terminal or telodendria. And at the very, very, very tippy end of those telodendria will be little swollen areas referred to as a synaptic knob. Okay, here it is all labeled for you. And let's, let's look at this cell and learn how to label this beautiful cell. We'll start at the very center. We have the nucleus. It's a rather large nucleus. Um, it takes up a pretty good amount of the cytoplasm. In the very center of that nucleus, there will be a very obvious nucleolus. Remind me, what does the nucleolus do? Nucleolus was responsible for synthesizing parts for ribosomes. Right? And I've already told you that these cells are very protein synthetic. They're making lots of proteins. So they're going to have a very prominent nucleolus. In the cytoplasm, out in the perikaryon, out in the so soma, you're going to see these splotchy spots, right? Those splotchy spots are what Mr. Nissel saw, named after him, the Nissel bodies. Unfortunately, this slide doesn't use the word Nissel bodies. They use instead chromatophilic substances. Um, don't shoot me. There's just a lot of terms in, neuro in neuroscience. So Nissel bodies, named after the person, are sometimes called chromatophilic substances. Break that word down for me. Philic. An affinity for or love for, right? And chromo. Color. So when you're staining these neurons with stains, these dots took up, they took up dye, right? They took up color. Chromatophilic substances. Nissel called them after him. Other books call them chromatophilic substances. We now know that those chromatophilic substances or those Nissel bodies are clumps of ribosomes and rough ER. So much protein being made that you can see it under the light microscope. This cell has lots of these small branch-like structures. So I'm seeing lots of dendrites around here. And the slide reminds us with this red arrow that the information is only coming in through the dendrites. There is one much longer process, right? There's one much longer process. This is the axon. It is connected to the soma through this triangular or funnel-shaped or conically-shaped structure called the axon hillock. It's quite long. Um, it could be much, much longer than this cartoon represents. Some of your axons are, well, some of my axons are a meter long. 
right? I have axons going from my spinal cord down to my big toe. And those in a person my height would easily be three feet long. So this is way underrepresented as far as length. Okay, but you have these very, very long axons. And this, the line reminds us that information, electrical information, is moving away from the soma down the axon. The axon, only one, can have some branches. So there's a collateral or a branch coming off. At the very, very end, those finger-like extensions are the telodendria. And at the very, very end of those telodendria will be little synaptic knobs, little swollen ends of the telodendria. The other name, again, for those telodendria are the axon terminals. Along the length of the axon, I'm seeing something different. There are cells that dedicate their entire life to wrapping around and protecting and supporting the axon. Those cells, again named after a dude, Schwann cells. Schwann cells. The other name, when you take away the guy's name, are the neurolemocytes. Okay, let's think about that term. Neuro, neuron, nerve, lemo. Rind or peel, outside layer, right, layers. And then sight, right? So it's a cell that puts layers around parts of a neuron. Neurolemocytes, a.k.a. Schwann cells. Each of those cells has its own little nucleus. Okay, so you see a little purple nucleus. This is a separate cell. All right, so you've got one neuron, and you've got as many as hundreds, even thousands of these Schwann cells down along the length of the axon protecting it. These Schwann cells can divide. They can be damaged. They can replace themselves, right? These are mitotic. And there are little spaces in between these Schwann cells. Those little spaces are referred to as the nodes. Again, named after a dude, nodes of Ron VA. The nodes of Ron VA. You're going to see all this labeled and written out in other places. So those are the parts of the neuron that you'll need to learn and to label and love and know. And we'll talk more about each of these areas as we go through this. Any question on the neuron? Great cells. Really kind of complex. I'm going to make it as simple as I can for you. This is one of those one in a million shots under the microscope. For you to get this image, you're not going to see anything this nice up in the lab. Because the tissue, as the nervous tissue is sliced through, you have to get one neuron to cooperate and to show all these dendrites and a long axon all in the same thin plane. It's just really difficult to, to have this. So what we see here is the neuron, right? We've got the, the major cell body. So this whole thing would be the neuron. Uh, the majority of the neuron, what I'm circling, is the what? Body. Cell body or soma or perikaryon. I've got a really good-sized nucleus, and I've got a dark staining uh, nucleolus in there as well. Out in the cytoplasm, I can see little chunks. Those chunks are chromatophilic substances, a.k.a. the nissel bodies. I can see a lot of short processes across the top. So they're labeling this is a dendrite, this is a dendrite, 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 dendrite. In this particular image, there's a much longer process. They're calling that the axon. The axon is attached through this large conical area referred to as the axon hillock. Are they sure? Can you tell an axon by looking at it? No. But in this view, we're going to call that one the axon because it is by far the longest visible process, and it does appear to be connected by a large triangular region. If I had a different view of this, though, right, it's possible that maybe this dendrite ends right, this could be a dendrite, it ends right there, and that this sucker right here goes on for three miles that direction, right, and that would be the axon, and this would be the axon hillock. I'm never, it's not going to be confusing, right, I'm never going to ask you which one is which, I, but I'd want you to appreciate that the author is kind of guessing here, okay, because you really can't tell an axon from a dendrite from looking just at a small portion of it. 
you'd have to be absolutely confident that, it, that it's the only one that goes on and on and on to be the axon. In the background, I see a lot of other dark staining nuclei. Those other dark staining cells, we really don't see the cells, but I'm seeing all of these nuclei, right? Those are what? Right, there's, there's, there's a good 35, 40 cells that I can see all over the place. Those are some of the glia, the glial cells that are supporting or nourishing the neuron. I think of the neuron as being the queen bee, right? Only one, very important, got to maintain the queen bee or the hive dies kind of idea. So we've got to keep the, the queen bee happy. We've got to keep the neuron alive and stable. And all these other cells are the workers. They're the helpers. They're the supporters, and they're there to protect and nourish this very important cell. Remember that the glial cells can be killed and replaced, but the neuron, that's it can't replace it. So we've got to protect the queen bee. Now neurons, the ones I've shown you, the one we labeled just a moment ago is pretty typical. That's the one you'll have to label or one like it. But I want you to appreciate that neurons come in multiple um, shapes and they're found in different places. Right? We'll talk about sensory neurons and motor neurons. They're in different places. We'll talk about um, also the morphology, the shape. Remember tonight, vocab, morph means form or shape. So there are three different shapes of neurons that we'll be seeing in this course. Pretty easy. The name kind of tells you what to expect. Unipolar, one pole, bipolar, and multipolar. I'll start with the bottom. That's multipolar. This is what you labeled a moment ago. This is the neuron that has quite a few processes, three or more total could be thousands of dendrites and one axon, right? So multiple dendrites, one axon is going to be considered multipolar. This is the most common type in your body. So multipolar, most multiple, right? Most, most numerous. Um, next to multipolar, I just want you to make a note and put motor. Your motor neurons are going to be multipolar. Then I'll go to the top, unipolar. This is going to look a little different than what you imagine, but it's a cell, it's a soma, that has only one pole, one process sticking out of it. I'll show you a picture in a moment, and next to it, it already says sensory. So circle the word sensory. Um, the sensory neurons that we look at this semester will be unipolar in their shape. Then there are bipolar neurons. We won't be seeing any this semester. I'll show you a picture of them briefly, but bipolar neurons are pretty special. They're found only in your taste buds and in your vision and some of the, the special senses. So we won't be dealing with them this much, uh, that much at all this semester. Let's take a look at pictures. I think the pictures are really easy for us. So in all of these, I'll start at the bottom. On the bottom, we have two different multipolar neurons. The one on the bottom left Kind of simple in relative uh, terms, but you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, there's at least five or six dendrites. There's one axon. That axon can branch off as collaterals, but there's only one axon leaving the soma, and there's the soma, right? That's a multipolar axon. Sorry, neuron. Multipolar neuron. Over here, you just see a more you know, extensive dendritic tree but it's still multipolar. That's what your motor neurons are going to look like. That's the most common type in your body. That's what we labeled. On the middle, you have your soma, your cell body. There are two processes. One's dendrite, one's axon. Simple enough, bipolar. Not going to be dealing with them this semester, but that's what it would look like, right? Two poles, bipolar. Then the unipolar, in pictures, they're going to be looking like this. They're going to look like a cell body, and they're going to show you a little nucleus, and they're going to come out to like a letter T. Okay? So you've got a soma, and you see only one process coming off from it. Some of it's labeled dendrite. Some of it's labeled axon. I'm never going to ask you which side is which. right? You can't really tell. If I were to ask you on this bipolar neuron, which side is dendrite, 
which side is x on, you can't tell me from this drawing. Okay, so don't worry about that. Um, even at the top, you really can't tell which side is dendrite and which side is axon. They just sort of have um, everything labeled for you. Again, your sensory neurons are going to be unipolar. Your motor neurons are going to be multipolar. There's one other type of neuron that I want you to know about, and these are the interneurons. Now, what does inter mean? About 50% of you know what inter means. Unfortunately, the other 50% weren't sure on the test. Between, right? Inter between. Intervertebral foramen, the opening between the vertebra, right? So inter means between. So what are the interneurons? The neurons between. Between what? Between the incoming sensory and the outgoing motor neurons. These are, the, these are the real brains of your nervous system. The interneurons are also called the association neurons. That's a word I won't use very much, but you'll see it. So do know that they're the same thing. But the interneurons are going to be completely within the central nervous system. They're completely within your brain. They're completely contained within your spinal cord. And they are, shape-wise, they are multipolar. Okay, so they, they're multipolar, so were the, the motor neurons. So the motor and the interneurons are going to be multipolar in shape. These are the guys receiving all the information. Right, so it makes sense if they're multipolar. They're going to have lots of dendrites because they're receiving all this sensory information coming into your brain, coming into your spinal cord. So they're the thinkers. These are the integrators. They're going to receive all this information, and then they're going to send signals out the motor neurons. The vast majority of your neurons are interneurons. Here I've got 99% of your neurons are interneurons. In lab, I think I have a slide that says 90 plus percent. Don't worry about the percentage, the vast majority, right? 90 plus percent of all of your neurons in your body are these interneuron types found completely contained within your central nervous system. Let's put this together. We, we've talked about neurons, we've talked about sensory versus motor, and this is a picture you're going to see a lot of, or one very, very similar to it in the next few weeks, two weeks or so. You haven't seen this big thing over here on the right. This is the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is shown to you, and you'll always recognize the spinal cord because you'll see this butterfly-shaped structure within it. Okay? So just know this whole thing is the spinal cord, the column of the spinal cord. And in this demonstration, in this picture, uh, this woman, uh, something, is, is, something is, is tickling or irritating. Maybe it's a bug or, I don't know, a mosquito. But something is, is uh, picking up on her sensory receptors. So she has little dendrites in her skin. And those little dendrites are going to pick up the signal. And they're going to send that signal through a sensory neuron. Right? It's afferent, coming in. It's going to come into the spinal cord. This yellow thing is a spinal nerve. Okay? The nerves we see coming off from the spinal cord. What do we have right here? What does that look like? That is that unipolar shape, isn't it? That is actually the cell body for this sensory neuron. So no matter what we're talking about, on the surface of your body, you've got neurons, right, that are picking up sensations, touch and everything else, hot, pain, cold. And those dendrites are picking up those signals, and they're traveling to the spinal cord. And just outside the spinal cord, there's going to be a unipolar neuron cell body for that sensory neuron. That neuron continues to send its signal into the spinal cord. Well, what you can see is that it synapses, it connects to, comes into close proximity. Synapse. Right, so a synapse is where two cells, these two neurons, come almost into touching each other. And you see that the blue, the blue is the sensory neuron. And it's now going to communicate with this purple neuron. This is a interneuron. 
is completely contained within the spinal cord. Morphologically, this interneuron is what? I see many dendrites and one axon, so that is considered a multipolar neuron. It's an interneuron as well. So we have two names to think about for this. Then, this interneuron is one receiving all the information, right? It's going to think about it amazingly fast and decide to send out a signal. And it's going to now synapse with another neuron. And this is now an outgoing motor or efferent neuron. And this neuron is now going to send the signal out of the spinal cord, down the spinal nerve, and go to what looks like the biceps brachii. Right, we just flex, flex and, and splash that or slap that bug off your shoulder, or scratch your shoulder. Okay. So now we're seeing the connection, right? We've got incoming sensory neuron talking to an interneuron, which then talks to an outgoing motor neuron. Afferent in, efferent out. The sensory neuron is outside the spinal cord, so that's peripheral. The interneuron was completely within the spinal cord, so that is central nervous system. The motor neuron leaves the spinal cord, so it's also considered peripheral. Right? So you see the overlapping. You got peripheral going in, talking to central, coming out peripheral. Does that all make reasonable sense at this point? Okay, how we're using these words, putting these things together making connections. Let's add even one more level of understanding here. If this neuron is coming out and is going to skeletal muscle, tell me what other word I could use to describe. This neuron is part of what division? It's going to skeletal muscle. So I would say even more completely, this is a motor neuron. It's, it's moving something. But it's also a somatic motor, right? Because it's going to move the body at a skeletal muscle. If this signal was instead going to the heart, cardiac muscle, going to the gut, smooth muscle, or going to a gland telling it to secrete something, then we would say that it's autonomic motor. So that's the neuron, and that's how neurons talk to each other in a very simplified way. Now we have to go back and deal with those glial cells, those glue cells that are supporting and protecting the neurons. Sometimes, again, they're mentioned as neuroglia. There are different glia cells, glial cells, in the CNS and the PNS, and I'll make the distinction for you. Now these glial cells are mitotic. Right? They are capable of dividing. They can be killed off and they can replace themselves. So they are mitotic. They do not, however, carry electrical signals. They're not there. They're not excitable. Right? They're not excitable. They do not receive or send electrical signals. They are instead there to protect and nourish and support the queen bee, right? the neuron. Uh, the glial cells far outnumber the neuron. And you saw that in that image of the neuron under the microscope. You saw one neuron surrounded by, you know, 30, 40 of these black nuclei, right, for the glial cells. So you know that the glial cells are more numerous than neurons. In fact, in a young adult, you're going to have about eh, as many as 100 billion neurons, but you're going to have up to a trillion glial cells. Okay, so it can be a far greater number. If you took your brain and your spinal cord and you accounted for its volume, about half of all the volume of your brain and spinal cord would be composed of these glial cells. They're very small, but there's so many of them that they would make up a large, you know, 50% or so of the volume. So let me go through these different glial cells. Note that at the top it says CNS. So the glial cells I'm about to tell you about are only in the central nervous system. These are the ones that I listed about six slides back, and I had you put CNS next to. The first are astrocytes. OK. So when you hear the word astro, what comes to mind? Stars. For me, it's the Jetsons dog. 
right? And then I think of stars, right? Astro. But stars, right? So astrocytes must somehow be shaped like stars. And they are. They kind of have this star shape to them. Now, these are the most abundant of your glial cells. They account for as much as 90% of the brain in some places. Their job, though, is to create a structural network and to help maintain the blood-brain barrier, the BBB. Uh, the blood-brain barrier is basically an extra level pr of protection, keeping potentially harmful molecules and organisms out of your central nervous system. It's a great design by your body to keep things out of this thing called your brain. However, the blood-brain barrier can create problems in modern medicine. Uh, if you're trying to treat a brain tumor, and you give a person most medications, those medications can't cross into the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. So treating brain diseases and cancers and things is more difficult because of these astrocytes. So the, the blood-brain barrier is, and the astrocytes are, are maintaining uh, this special extra level of protection and are allowing certain things in and out of your brain matter. We also know that these astrocytes replace dead neurons. As we get older, we're going to lose neurons. Um, and those neurons don't replace themselves, right? They, they can't divide. They can't uh, regenerate. So that space will be taken up by these astrocytes. And finally, it is so cool to imagine, how is it that every neuron in your body knows where to go? Right? You've got all these extension cords coming down from your brain and your spinal cord. And they're connecting to every single muscle cell, every single gland cell. You know, they're coming out and touching all the muscle cells, the smooth muscle cells of your gut. So all of these neurons had to know where to plug in, right, where to connect. And we know that these astrocytes, through very complex mechanisms, are sort of guiding the axon to its proper place. So there's some cool things about astrocytes and, and neuronal development. Number two on the list were the ependymal cells. Ependymal sounds a lot like epithelial in a way. These are, in fact, epithelial cells. They are lining the fluid-filled chambers of your brain and spinal cord. Your brain is surrounded by fluid. Your spinal cord is surrounded by fluid. But also inside your spinal cord, inside your brain, there are fluid-filled compartments. And they are all lined by these cells called ependymal cells. And these cells are making that fluid. So the ependymal cells are making the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF. Number three, microglia. Small, right? Microbes today on vocab. Small glial cells. Their purpose is they are phagocytic. They're like little Pac-Man, right? They're going to come around and chomp up dead and dying neurons. They're going to clean up the environment. If a bacterium or a virus were to make it into the brain, then these cells would be part of your immune system there. In the skin, we had Langerhans cells, right? Those little phagocytic cells in the sp in stratum spinosum. Here we have microglia that would do a similar job. Finally, there are oligodendrocytes. Oligo is a prefix we haven't quite gotten to, but we will very, very soon. Oligo means few. Okay, oligo, just a few. And dend, we know means what? Tree, right? So these are cells with a few tree-like structures, and I'll show these to you in a moment. Oligodendrocytes are going to wrap around axons in the CNS and provide the myelin. Okay. What cell did this job back in the peripheral nervous system? What cell made the myelin? Individual little cells wrapped around the axon? Schwann cells. Schwann cells, right? So oligodendrocytes are like Schwann cells, except oligodendrocytes are only found in the CNS. Schwann cells are only going to be seen in the peripheral nervous system. And I'll come back to that. So here's the picture that I want you to put a little star next to. This is the picture you will likely see again. And the one I want you to know how to label and identify these different glial cells. You're looking at a chunk of the brain. Okay, tells us that. We're looking at a little chunk of the brain up here. 
And in this cartoon representation, I have two neurons. I see two big neurons, biggest cells in the picture, right? Big neurons. My other four glial cells are also present. The big green dude, right? This guy kind of has all these extensions. This is the astrocyte. The astrocyte is creating a structural framework, but it's also, you see, touching the capillary. It is regulating the fluid that can go into and the molecules that can go into and out of the brain. So those astrocytes are regulating, plugging up, controlling the blood-brain barrier. Lining these pink cells over here are the ependymal cells. They are epithelial-like cells, and they are lining this fluid-filled region of the brain called a ventricle. We'll see the ventricles when we get to the brain chapter, but there are hollow sections inside your brain, fluid-filled with CSF, and those ependymal cells are lining those, those areas. The little tiny guy in here and here kind of looks like a miniature little neuron. That's a microglia. Right, those are little phagocytic cells. They're kind of wandering around and chewing up things that are dying or decaying or invading. Finally, there are the oligodendrocytes. There's one, here's one, here's one, and there's part of one. And what, there's something different here. This cell is reaching out with a few branch-like extensions, tree-like extensions. This oligodendrocyte has one, two, three, four branches. And it's reaching out not to just one, but to multiple axons, and is putting myelin around that axon. OK, more about myelin in a moment. But we see a very different architecture here, right? Oligodendrocytes look different than Schwann cells. They do the same job, but they look quite different. So those are your four different glial cells along with the neurons. Again, this is C and S. You're in the brain. These images are just subsets of that. I would not ask you to recognize these images. It just does the same thing again. So we're still in the CNS, and I see now this large astrocyte. It has all these extensions coming out. It's creating a framework, but also plugging up the capillaries. I see the ependymal cells lining the fluid-filled chambers of the brain, making CSF little tiny microglial cells, oops, and then finally the oligodendrocyte on the lower right, one cell reaching out with a limited number of branches and putting myelin around the axons. So what is this myelin? What's the deal with this stuff? Uh, myelin is made as I've said three or four times now, by the neurolemocytes, a.k.a. the Schwann cells, when we are aware, when we're in the peripheral nervous system. So we've got to keep, connect these terms, Schwann cell and PNS. Always, always, always. Whereas CNS, myelin was made by what? Oligodendrocytes, right? So just keep those two different terms in mind. Myelin is a protein. It has a lot of fat in it, though. It's a lipoprotein. It has a lot of lipids in it as well. It is going to appear very white and shiny, kind of glossy. And when you hear about <coughs> brain matter, right, you'll hear about white matter, right? White matter and gray matter, white and gray, sort of like white and dark meat. White matter within the brain is white because of myelin. Okay, so wherever you've got white matter in the brain, that chunk of brain matter is primarily axons, right? Because where do we see myelin? Only around axons. If instead you're looking at a chunk of gray matter from the brain, well, it's not white. What's not there? No myelin. What part of a neuron doesn't have myelin around it? Look back at any of the pictures, and you won't see myelin around the dendrites, and you won't see myelin on the soma. Right? You only see myelin wrapped around the axon. So if you're talking about white matter, it's going to be primarily parts of the nervous system that has axons. If you're talking about gray matter, 
it is going to be primarily parts of the nervous system that are made of cell bodies or dendrites. So myelin is a glossy white protective protein made by these Schwann cells or the oligodendrocytes. It protects the, the axon sort of like electrical tape. Not only is it providing structural support, but it's also keeping that electrical signal from dissipating as it travels down this very, very long axon. So it's going to insulate right, the electrical signal going down the axon. This is a single drawing of glial cells in the PNS. Okay? And I'm going to give you permission right now to cross off satellite cells. We're not going to talk about satellite cells at all this semester. But and when you see this picture again, what am I seeing? I'm seeing individual cells, right, individual cells wrapped around the axon. Those are Schwann cells, a.k.a. neurolemocytes. And if I see that, I know I'm in the peripheral nervous system. So... There are four glial cells in the CNS, the astrocytes, ependymal, microglia, oligodendrocytes. There's only one glial cell I'm asking you to know from the peripheral nervous system, and that is the Schwann cell. So this myelin, really important stuff. It's going to make sure that the voltage doesn't change as the electrical signals traveling down that very long axon. Dendrites don't need it because dendrites aren't very long, right? So they don't need the extra insulation. Again, oh, I'm going to say it like 16 times, so you better, you better know this fact, right? Again, here are the cells that make the myelin, right? The Schwann cells in the PNS or the oligodendrocytes in the CNS. And let me show you what's going on here. Uh, this yellow structure that's going down, this is the axon. Okay, and there's the axon. And... I'm going to go ahead and introduce this term right now. An axon is also, in some books, and I'll say it too, is the same as a nerve fiber. Okay? Oh, my. Not to confuse us, right? But fiber sure is a word used in many, many different ways. So back in connective tissue world, right, a fiber was what? Collagen fiber, elastic fiber, reticular fiber, proteins. In muscle world, a fiber referred to the entire muscle cell. In nerve, in neurons, the axon is considered a nerve fiber. Only the axon, okay, the nerve fiber. So the neuron is equal to the nerve fiber. And here, you see that that neuron is being completely encapsulated and protected by a neurolemocyte, a Schwann cell. Again, this cell has its own nucleus, right? Own little nucleus, own little metabolism, own structure, completely separate from, but dedicated to the neuron's protection. And this little neurolemocyte will wrap around the axon all the way around and eventually fill up its entire cytoplasm with layer after layer after layer of this white fatty protein called myelin tens to hundreds of layers of this myelin protein. In fact, there's really all that's left in the cell. And the nucleus for this Schwann cell gets pushed out to the outside edge. When this happens, right, the neuron is very well protected. And here, again, we're reminded of the two different architectures of myelinating cells. So on the top, I see four oligodendrocytes, don't I? And they're reaching out, and collectively they are putting a section of myelin, right? Whereas if I'm in, this, in the peripheral nervous system, I see it, an individual cell dedicating its entire life to wrapping around a portion of the axon. Everyone okay with the difference there? On the top, CNS. On the bottom, PNS. While I'm here, what sort of morphology would this be? The neuron on the bottom... I see many dendrites in one axon, so we could use the word multipolar. Of the different types of neurons, which two are multipolar? 
motor neurons were multipolar, as were the interneurons. Right? The interneurons and the motor neurons have this shape to them, multipolar shape. Now, all axons have Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes supporting them. However, some axons will be considered unmyelinated. And let me show you the difference in what a unmyelinated axon looks like. If I go back to the bottom picture, this is definitely a, a myelinated axon, right? And I've got Schwann cells wrapped around it, completely protecting part of that axon. And between, there are some little spaces called what again? Yeah, here it's called a neurofibril node, but I won't use that word. I'll just say node of Ron VA, right? Now, the significance of that will be more clearly laid out next semester. But when there are nodes of Ron VA, the electrical signal can jump very, very quickly down the axon. It actually facilitates a faster electrical signal. It's sort of like throwing a rock on a, on a lake, and it skips, right? Skip jumps over the little ripples. So that little rock jumps very, very quickly, goes across the water. If that rock had to go continuously across the water, it would take longer, wouldn't it? So skip, that, skip, that rock skipping across the top is what these nodes of Ron VA allowed, and that is referred to as saltatory conduction. So when there is a myelinated axon, the electrical signal can jump from node to node to node, and we refer to that as saltatory conduction. No details right now. No details this semester. But I'm going to tell you right now that there's a lot of sodium involved in neurons working properly. And we know that sodium chloride is salt, right? Table salt. So it may be one way to remember it. Saltatory conduction um, definitely is going to involve some sodium when we get there next semester. If there are no nodes, then we refer to the axon as unmyelinated. Still has a Schwann cell. It's still going to look white, right? But it has an exposed edge, as I'll show you in a moment. And now the electrical signal can't skip, and it must go continuously down the axon. It's slower. It's just simply a slower signal that travels down a unmyelinated axon. So myelination allows the impulse to mo go more quickly. If it's unmyelinated, it's simply going to take longer. It's also more efficient if it has myelin. So if there's, if there's nodes of Ron VA and the signal can skip, then it takes less energy. Many of your pain neurons the neurons that sense pain, move down unmyelinated axons. Your pain signals are slower. Have you ever burned your finger? Right? And now, we haven't talked about reflexes yet. But you'll burn your finger, and you will reflexively and instinctively pull away from the damage, pull away from the trauma. And then you'll look at your finger, and then you'll say a four-letter word. Right? It takes a little bit of time for that pain signal to make it up to your brain. You've already pulled away. Right? So clearly, the signal has already gone to your central nervous system. You've already pulled away, but it takes a little bit longer for that pain to become conscious to you because your pain signals travel on a slower, unmyelinated kind of axon through your body. Have you ever heard of any conditions involving myelin? Any medical conditions? There are some conditions called demyelinating conditions. One of them that we've probably all heard of is multiple sclerosis. All right. So what happens in MS? Anybody know anybody with MS? It's not that uncommon a disease, right? So MS, right, in these individuals, uh, their myelin starts to break down. That's what's going on. The myelin breaks down. We don't understand why completely. It is a disease that happens more in women uh, more autoimmune, but we still don't understand it. And the myelin starts to break down. So these individuals start having some 
less than smooth movement. Their, their movements become a little bit jerkier. And their speech can be affected, their vision can be affected. And as the disease progresses, you know, they lose more and more myelin. Well, what is it doing? It's interrupting the flow of electrical information through the nervous system. And so information is not flowing smoothly, and they get these kind of hiccups in the movement. Well, what else am I telling you? I'm telling you that if there is myelin, that it's more energy efficient. These individuals also are exhausted. I mean, as the disease progresses, their daily activities are exhausting just to get through the day. In part, you can think of it this way, because they're having to use up more ATP to make their movements happen. Right? It's taking more ATP because more of the signals are having to move uh, down an unmyelinated axon. There's another disease. Um, uh, MS is demyelinating, demyelination of oligodendrocytes of central nervous system. There's a sister disease called Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome. If you've heard of that one, don't worry about it. But if you haven't, but it's a uh, same kind of idea. The myelin is broken down, but in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so Guillain-Barre or MS, similar demyelinating conditions. So this is what a unmyelinated axon would look like. What we have here, actually five, if you look, this Schwann cell is protecting and embedding five different axons, right? So here's one Schwann cell, here's the nucleus for that Schwann cell, and it is protecting five different axon fibers or nerve fibers. But it's not wrapping around in the same architecture. And there's always going to be now an exposed edge along that axon. There's no node. There's no chance for skipping. There's no chance for that signal to move quickly. It's still protected. It still has a Schwann cell. It's still going to be, quote, white, but it has an exposed edge. So now the electrical signal must travel continuously and more slowly down this arrangement. It's not random, right? This is the way they're designed to be, okay? It's not like some axons get myelinated and some don't, and that causes a problem. This is just the way the nervous system has been put together. Can the nervous system regenerate? A little bit, not much. Really very little regeneration in the central nervous system, right? Brain injury, spinal cord injury, not going to happen. Very little regeneration. But there is the possibility of an axon to repair itself. Not the whole neuron, right? The neuron can't divide. In fact, what organelle are neurons missing so that they cannot divide? This is a test question. Test number two. Neurons don't have centrioles. The question didn't put all this together, but it said, if a cell does not have centrioles, it cannot do what? And the answer was divide, right? Centrioles were the structure that sends out the mitotic spindles, right, for uh, mitosis. So you don't have centrioles, you can't divide. Neurons don't have centrioles, they can't divide. There's just no chance they can. Okay. But there is an opportunity for axons to repair. Limited, let me talk about that. So in this scenario, I've got a multipolar axon, or neuron, right? We see this multipolar, many dendrites, one axon. This would be a motor neuron. I know it's a motor neuron because it's going down to muscle, okay? So it's going to be somatic motor neuron. And I see this long axon, and along the axon, I see my little Schwann cells. There's been some sort of trauma, though. And... Now the axon has been severed. When that happens, the body will clean up all the damaged goods. So all of this stuff will get just kind of broken up and, and taken away. However, there might still be Schwann cells, right, down along that pathway. And those Schwann cells, if they're still there, can start secreting what's called nerve growth factor. And as they secrete nerve growth factor, 
there is what's called the regeneration tube. I think it's on the previous slide. But there's the regeneration tube that is formed. And what happens is that, that little axon starts to go down that little tube. I think it was like Hansel and Gretel, right? Little breadcrumbs. So the axon now has little breadcrumb signals. It knows where to go, and it can reconnect to the muscle and restore function. Okay. So this can happen in a limited capacity over short distances. Have you ever had frostbite? Right? You've you gone numb in your fingers from playing in the snow too long. And for a few days, you can't feel your fingertips, maybe. may even go on for weeks. But at some point, you get feeling back. That would be peripheral nerve damage and regeneration of that nerve through this kind of phenomenon. My son, a few years ago, was doing something crazy in the gym on a box jump thing. And he, and he missed. And he, and he landed very, very hard across his shin. And as such, this is about three years ago, he still doesn't have any feeling. He can move everything. He's got full and fun muscle control, but he can't feel that little patch of area on his leg. I was hopeful, right, that maybe a couple, within a year or two after that damage, that the neurons would regenerate and he would now have restored sensation there. And it hasn't happened. And here's why, right? There, there's some rules here as to what can happen. If you have a cut or a crushing injury to some neurons, there can be regeneration, not of the entire neuron, but just of the axon. And here are the three factors that are going to limit that. Number one, how much damage was there, right? How much crushing damage was there to the neuron or to the axon? Number two, did the Schwann cells get maintained? If the Schwann cells are still there and they start secreting that nerve growth factor, they can create that little rabbit trail, that little trail of breadcrumbs. And the axon can begin to regenerate down that tube. And then, of course, how far is the damage of the axon from the muscle or from the effector? That's the big word. The effector is where is the efferent neuron going? It's called the effector. Clearly, if I've got a neuron going from my spinal cord down to my big toe and I sever that axon at my hip, it's not going to find its way back to my big toe. If, however, I were to sever that axon down in my foot or down by the toe, there'd be a much greater opportunity right, for that regeneration to occur. There's no real rules here, but those are the general uh, ways to think about are you going to get regeneration of that or not? Any questions? Now, now, thinking about this, why can't central nervous system axons regenerate? I'm hearing they're in the brain and spinal cord. That's true. They don't let go of them just like, is it because they don't wrap themselves around it? Ding, 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 ding. In the peripheral nervous system, you've got dedicated Schwann cells leading a pathway to where the axon should go. In the central nervous system, you've got those oligodendrocytes. They're not creating a path, are they? You've got random cells sticking out and creating a myelin layer around various axons. There's no highway. There's no regeneration tube. Right? So because of the architecture, because of oligodendrocytes and the way that they protect the axon, there is no Hansel and Gretel opportunity. Right? There's no more uh, regeneration tube. So the chance of a central nervous system axon finding its effector is essentially zero. So not only can the neurons not regenerate, but the axons can't find their path away, path again. So the amount of regeneration is essentially zero. Okay, after any kind of brain or spinal cord injury. There can be some slight recovery, right? I don't want to, if this person has a brain injury or a stroke, there can be some recovery. It's not, however, because neurons regenerated or because axons found their way. There's some other issues that we'll talk about when we get to the brain where there can be some recovery, of, but it is very limited. 
I am going to stop there. We've got just about, oh, six or eight slides left for this presentation. This is exactly how far I got this morning as well. We'll finish up with how a neuron is different from a nerve. We'll finish up with just a couple of more concepts on Thursday. We'll then pick up with chapter 12, which is all about the spinal cord. After that, it'll be chapter 13 on the brain, and then chapter 14 on the autonomic nervous system. So this is a really fun unit. I think it is. There is a lot of new vocabulary. I do not have your mastering assignments loaded yet for this next test. I will, hopefully, by tomorrow. Okay? Uh, most of you aren't worried about that right now anyway, right? You're thinking about your uh, exam tonight, your lab exam, or you're thinking about that pre-lab that you'll be doing for next week. So, or maybe your short paper. Um, if you have a few minutes, think about what topic you want to study and, and go find some papers on, and I'll give you some more guidelines on that on Thursday as well. So come up and see me if you have any specific questions.